Perforations or holes in the Lisa or Monstera deliciosa is one of the most highly sought after commodities in the world. Sort of. If you were to offer me the choice between a Rolex or an extra large deliciosa with an abundance of perforations in the leaves, then I'm taking the plant every time. So what dark arts do you need to perform to achieve such a feat? Well, it's not as hard as you might think. Firstly, it's important to understand what plant you actually have and what this means for perforation development. Now I've made a video all about this recently, but there are many varieties of Monstera plants out there, and two of the most popular are the Borzigiana and the Deliciosa. The Borzigiana is the most common, and is the one you can always find in your local Ikea, but unfortunately for us, it's also less willing to develop perforations. The Deliciosa, on the other hand, which is also referred to as the large form Monstera, is a much larger sprawling plant that will develop lots more fenestrations and perforations as it gets older and bigger. All this essentially means is that we need to get the conditions right, especially for a Borzigiana, to develop holes in the leaves. Monsteras develop perforations with age. The older a Monstera is, the more perforations it will have. So to have a successful plant that your friends will be jealous of, you need to give it lots of time and lots of light. Have a close look at the stems of your Monstera. How big are the gaps between the leaves? If the gaps are larger than the width of your hand, then your plant is not getting enough light. This is certainly the case with my Monstera in my bedroom. This plant does sit about two meters away from my bedroom window. I can tell it's not really getting enough light because it's pretty slow growing. None of the leaves have any perforations and there are large gaps on the stems between the leaves. The more light your Monstera gets, the more it can generate energy for growth through photosynthesis and the quicker it will push out new leaves. This means that the stems do not become elongated with larger and larger gaps between each leaf node. The Monstera that sits on my living room windowsill gets tons of light with a few hours of direct afternoon sunlight and the gaps on the stems is much shorter. A good way to assess how much light any plant in your home is getting is to get on the floor and see the world from their viewpoint and look how much of the sky it can see. If the view of the sky is obstructed by your walls and ceiling, as well as some trees outside in your garden, that it's not getting much natural light. If it has a clear 180 degree view of the sky, then it'll be very happy. I mentioned my Monstera in my living room gets a few hours of direct sun a day, and I know this goes against conventional wisdom for indoor plants, but this plant can absolutely thrive in some direct sunlight provided we give it time to adjust. Don't grab your Monstera that normally lives in a north-facing spot in your home and chuck it on your south-facing windowsill overnight and expect it to be living its best life. This is too much shock for the plant and you'll see some burning on the leaves. Instead, set your plant a couple of meters back from your south-facing windowsill and gradually move it closer to the light over a period of a few weeks. Keep increasing its hours of exposure to direct light slowly to allow it to become accustomed to it. If you see any discoloration in the leaves, then simply slow down. You're probably going at too fast a pace. The point of doing all this is that you'll eventually be rewarded with highly fenestrated Monstera with lots of highly prized fenestrations in the leaves. And here's the thing, fenestrations and perforations in the leaves is a direct response to natural light. When this plant gets lots of light, it sends a signal that it can reduce leaf surface area at the top so that the lower leaves get their fair share of light too. This is exactly what happens in the jungle as the plant creeps up its surrounding trees. It grows higher and higher up to the canopy of the jungle and the highest leaves become more and more fenestrated to allow the lower leaves of the plant to access the light. Pretty smart, eh? Keep this plant in a dark spot in your home and you'll have a boring plant that is slow growing with hardly any funky holes or slits in the leaves. I do know that this is sometimes unavoidable though. Some of us just don't have the luxury of a south or west facing window in our home. Instead, we might have a home with a north facing aspect that makes it tricky to keep plants happy. If this is you, then I feel you. I live in a damp, gloomy climate that gets very little sun. So much so that all we do around here is moan about it all day. I reckon the sun comes out to say hello about 30% of the 
time. It's tricky to give my plants the light they need. This is why I have a few grow lights dotted around the house. And if you're in a similar situation to me, and this can be a good option. It allows you to give your Monstera 12 hours or more of the light it needs to help it thrive. And check out my link to Sansi Grow Lights in the description down below and use Shuffle 15 for a 15% discount at checkout. One of the main distinguishing features of this gorgeous plant is the absolutely hideous aerial roots that protrude everywhere from the stems. These things seem to come out of this plant left, right and center, searching for something to latch onto and they grow surprisingly quickly. Most folks are not really sure what to do with them and I was in the same boat a few years ago. Should we cut them off? Should we leave them be? Or should we somehow cultivate them? Now I used to cut these off, but I have since realized the benefit of keeping them. And if you are in the habit of cutting them off, then fear not, this is not harming your plant in any way. But the secret here is that making use of those aerial roots will strengthen the plant and make it much more stable in the pot it lives in. I recently posted a video on my Patreon page where I repotted my Monstera that had a very unstable main stem. It was wafting around all over the place when my kids would run past it. I repotted it in a way that encourages the aerial roots to grow into the soil, anchoring it in the pot at another growth node on the stem, stabilizing the plant and making it much stronger. So if your Monstera feels a little unstable in its pot and tends to waft around a lot, direct the aerial roots into the soil to help anchor it at another leaf node you really will notice a difference with your plant. Doing this will mean that the pot it lives in will eventually get pretty crowded with all those extra roots. This might ring alarm bells in your head, knowing that a root bound plant tends to be an unhappy one. And for lots of plants, this is usually the case, but not always with a Monstera. They don't tend to mind having a snug pot. And this is absolutely perfect for us lazy plant parents, because it means less pot changes. If yours is root bound, then it won't necessarily mean the death of your plant. You don't have to rush to repot it as soon as you can. As long as you continue to give it enough water and nutrients, it will continue to happily live as it is. I tend to wait for my Monsteras to be very much root bound before repotting them. They prefer a drier soil, so drowning the roots in lots of soil risks overwatering issues. I made a video last year about diagnosing why my Monstera had developed a couple of yellow leaves. The diagnosis was that it was heavily root bound, but I didn't rush to repot it. In fact, only last week did I repot it in my Patreon video, and it's been absolutely fine. Monsteras are very robust plants, but they are susceptible to root rot if we keep them in inappropriate potting soils and water them too frequently. Water isn't the primary killer here though. The lack of oxygen around the roots is. If a plant's roots are not getting enough oxygen, they will suffocate in much the same way you would suffocate without oxygen. This should be your primary care when caring for your Monstera. Are the roots getting enough oxygen? And not necessarily, is it getting too much water? Don't get me wrong, too much water is a major problem, but it only compounds the issue and speeds up the rotting process. So we do have to get the water in right too. Put your Monstera in a potting media that has enough oxygen and a pot with drainage holes and you'll really struggle to kill your plant unless you really go for it. And what's a good potting medium? I keep it super simple with five parts compost to two parts perlite. The compost provides the nutrients and water retention and the perlite provides the oxygen around the roots. It really is a marriage made in heaven. One of the big myths in the plant world is that you should repot your plant as soon as you get it home from the shop. There is an assumption that the soil that the plant is in is worthless, but this is often misguided. Changing the soil too soon will actually often do more harm than good, especially because a new plant will need to settle into its new surroundings. And this is exactly the case with a Monstera. Growers generally do a pretty good job of putting plants in a medium that is perfectly suited to them, so just leave them be. With regards to watering, treat your Monstera deliciosa a little mean. What I mean by this is keep your plant on the drier side. They tend to respond well to not being watered often. If you saturate the soil of the plant often, then the plant is not going to respond well and growth will be stunted. I tend to water my Monstera plants about once every two or three weeks in the summer, which is typically less often than my other house plants, and they all respond very well to that schedule. Even if I forget to water them for longer, which I've done lots of times by the way, 
I never see this plant droop its leaves and it's pretty unusual like that. Do let me know in the comments if your Monstera droops when you've not watered it for a while. I probe all my plants with my trusty moisture meter and only when it says the plant is dry do I water the plant. Fertilizing your Monstera deliciosa is important for it to get the nutrients it needs to push out new growth, but I found that this isn't the most important thing for big bushy Monsteras. Fertilizing your plant gives it the macro and micronutrients it needs to have glossy green leaves, but in my experience, lighting and having it climb up something is generally more significant for its growth. That being said, make sure you do fertilize your plant during the spring and summer and not during the winter. Now be careful not to give the plant too much fertilizer by following the instructions on the packet. Otherwise you risk giving the roots fertilizer root burn, which causes long-term damage to the plant and growth will be inhibited. Disease such as powdery mildew can really stunt the growth of your Monstera deliciosa and may be one of the reasons why your Monstera is not pushing out lots of new growth. Powdery mildew is a fine white powder that can affect any part of the plant above the soil line. More severe cases can allow leaves and stems to become yellow along with stunted new growth. Powdery mildew is most likely to attack vulnerable plants such as dehydrated or unfertilized Monsteras as well as plants that have poor air circulation, high humidity and air excess moisture sitting on the leaves. Prevention of disease is key here, rather than curing problems that occur, so keep your plant clean and tidy by regularly pruning away dying leaves or stems and water and fertilize your plants correctly. Also, if you're misting your plant, then stop. This does nothing for your plant and increases the risk of mold or rot developing on the plant. Misting, misting, misting. The one houseplant myth that just seems to persevere no matter what. If you're in the habit of misting your Monstera daily, then you're ruining the burgeoning relationship you are trying to develop with your plant. The idea behind misting your plants, of course, is that they need high humidity to thrive. This is the big misconception in the houseplant community. We assume just because these plants experience high humidity in the jungle where they live, that we must replicate this in our homes for them to be happy. But honestly, just how feasible is this? It's nigh on impossible to have 80% humidity in our homes 24 seven. If we did, then there would probably be untold amounts of black mold building up on the walls and around our windows in our homes, which is no good for our health. And it's not really the low humidity in our homes that does damage to Monsteras, or any other plant for that matter. It's the swings in humidity. Imagine you're a person who lives in a very dry climate. You're used to the dry air and your skin and hair are always dry. One day, you go on vacation to a very humid climate. The humidity is so high that you feel like you're suffocating. You start to sweat profusely and your skin and hair become clammy. You're not used to the high humidity and it's making you very uncomfortable. Think Monica in Friends. When I go places with high humidity, it gets a little extra body, okay? In the same way, plants are not used to large swings in humidity. If the humidity in the air changes too much, it can stress the plant and make it more susceptible to disease. So if you have Monsteras in your home, then it's important to keep the humidity levels stable. So why doesn't misting work? Well, the water droplets from the mister land on the surface of the leaves and will evaporate quickly, leaving the leaves moist, but not really providing any additional air humidity. The amount of evaporation given off from the wet leaves will be so minuscule that no extra humidity is provided. In fact, misting your plants can actually make them more susceptible to disease. The water droplets can create a breeding ground for fungus and bacteria, which can infect the leaves. And I know what you're thinking. If Monsteras are so sensitive to having water in their leaves, then how do they survive when they get constantly rained on in the jungle? Well, it's all to do with air changes. The plant is obviously outside in the jungle and is subjected to higher air changes than inside from the wind. When it stops raining, everything dries out pretty quickly because of the wind and the high temperatures in the tropics. Inside, there are very little air changes, so moisture tends to sit on the leaves for a longer time, increasing the risk of mold and disease taking hold. Monsteras can be tricky plants to live with. They tend to go a bit out of control when they start to reach larger sizes. If you haven't got yours supported onto something like a moss pole or tied onto bamboo or planks of wood, then you're probably finding it quite hard to control. They do have a tendency to sprawl and grow out of the pot as their stems get longer and longer. And I actually found this with my smaller Monstera in my living room. It had one long stem that was doing its best to leave the pot it lived in 
and it ended up constantly flopping from side to side whenever anyone brushed past it. It needed repotting and the stem supporting so they could start to grow vertically rather than horizontally. Now, I made a video on my Patreon page repotting this plant, but looking back on it now, I've probably made a serious mistake that the plant is hating me for. I buried the stem into the soil so they were supported by the soil rather than staking it onto a moss pole or something. You see, there was an aerial root further along the stem and I was hoping that by burying the stem a little into the soil, it would encourage the aerial root to hurry up and grow into the soil, supporting the plant in the process. The plant uses aerial roots to support itself it's generally good practice to direct them into the soil so that the plant can grow stronger. The problem is though that burying the stems of a monstera too deep can be a problem because it can cause the stem to rot from too much moisture. The stems of a monstera are not meant to be buried in soil and if they are they'll potentially start to rot and die. This can be a serious problem as it can kill the plant. To avoid this problem, don't do what I did, but instead make sure that the stems of your monstera are not buried in soil. When you repot your monstera, just be sure to plant it at the same depth that it was growing in its previous pot. And don't be tempted to bury it any deeper to keep it in check. You risk the lower portion of the stems rotting, which is not really the place you want to be in. If you're unsure how deep to plant your monstera, it's always best to err on the side of caution and plant it a little bit shallower than you think it should be. Monsteras absolutely hate it when they are planted into a pot with coarse gravel added to the bottom instead of planted into a pot with drainage holes. This is a myth that has been around for decades but it's actually harmful to your plants, especially your monstera. The idea behind adding gravel to the bottom of the pot of course is they will supposedly create a barrier between the soil and the bottom of the pot where water can pool. This is supposed to prevent the roots of the plant from sitting in water which can lead to root rot. However, this doesn't actually work for two reasons. First, it's a little known fact that water does not move easily from fine textured materials like soil to coarse textured materials like gravel. In fact, the coarser the material, the more difficult it is for water to transfer to it from the soil. Water will only move from soil to coarse gravel when the soil is fully saturated. So when you add gravel to the bottom of a pot, you end up with soggy soil that sits on top of the gravel. This can actually lead to root rot because the roots of your monstera will be sitting in waterlogged soil, the opposite of what the hack is trying to do. The best way to prevent root rot is to use a plastic nursery pot with drainage holes. This will allow excess water to drain out of the pot so the roots of the plant don't sit in water. Secondly, the assumption seems to be that once the roots hit the gravel, they'll turn around and continue growing into the soil rather than into the water. This just doesn't happen, roots will follow the water. If there is water pooling at the bottom of the pot, then the roots will seek the water. Gravel isn't going to stop them. Monsteras are beautiful plants, but unfortunately they are magnets for dust. The monster in my bedroom is anyway. Give it just a couple of weeks and this plant has a new thick layer of dust on all the stems and all the leaves. You can understand why when you look at the plant, these big gorgeous leaves are perfect places for dust to settle. This, however, spells trouble for your plant. One of the most important things you can do to keep your monstera healthy is to remove dust from the leaves regularly. Dust can block the pores of the leaves, which prevents the plant from absorbing sunlight and carbon dioxide, and this could lead to stunted growth. I'm sure you all remember this from your school days, but as a quick recap, photosynthesis is the process by which plants use sunlight to convert carbon dioxide and water into oxygen and energy in the form of sugar. This process is essential for plant growth and survival. The pores on the leaves are called stomata. Stomata allows plants to take in carbon dioxide and release oxygen. They also allow water to evaporate from the leaves. So when dust builds up on leaves, it can block the stomata. This prevents the plant from taking in carbon dioxide and releasing oxygen. It also prevents the plant from evaporating water. Photosynthesis requires sunlight. So if your monstera is not getting enough sunlight because there's a thick layer of dust on the leaves, not be able to photosynthesize properly. So grab yourself a damp cloth, give your monstera a clean every couple of weeks and be sure to wipe or brush the leaves gently so you don't damage them. If you live in a dusty environment then you may need to clean it more often and your plant will love you for it. Monsteras are unlike most plants. Most of you will probably know that when you cut the stem of a plant it normally produces multiple stems in its place. It's a neat little trick to get super bushy plants like jades, pothos and philodendron that you can show off to all your friends and family. Just look at my philodendron melanocrysis. I hard pruned it a few weeks ago and now it's got more stems 
gems that it knows what to do with. Pretty neat, eh? And by the way, I know it's not Mel in a crisis. That's just me poking fun at him for how fussy he is. If you know, you know. Anyway, back to Monsteras. Monsteras do not respond in the same way as my Mel in a crisis here. Nope, no chance. Sorry to break it to you, but it just won't produce three or four new stems from where you make a cut. It'll just replace like with like. In fact, you're more likely just hurting your plant. Yes, if you have a lovely long stem with big, beautiful fenestrative leaves and lop it off lower down, not only will you only get one stem growing in its place, defeating the purpose of the prune in the first place, but that new growth will most likely revert back to a youngling. Yes, no highly prized fenestrations for you. Well, not for the first couple of leaves anyway. Those new leaves will resemble the original unloved leaves with no fenestrations from when it was a wee baba. And this is particularly true if you cut the stem back to where there are leaves with no fenestrations. You are basically cutting away the adult growth turning the clock back for him and making him all juvenile. It's like big in reverse. Or going back to the future. Wait. This is the thing with Monsteras. There are two stages of their lives. The youngling stage, where it's growing small, non-fenestrated leaves furiously, because it can't wait to become an adult and have its first drink. And then, when it's an adult, it tends to chill out a bit more and takes its time producing big fenestrated leaves. So cutting it back takes it back in time. If only we could all turn back time like this, eh? Let me take you back to when I was a newbie plant parent. Yes, hard to believe I know, but I really was the newbiest of noobs. If you're new here, that's noobs and not boobs. A trendy millennial word for newbie. I know, it doesn't suit me, does it? Back to the problem at hand. This monstera in my bedroom was actually one of my first plants, so it's a good 10 or so years old at this point. Blimey, he's nearly a teenager, and it will probably tell you all about the abuse it has received from me over the years as I was learning about what it wants through trial and error. There was no Sheffield May plants back then, you see. Hang on, hang on, that's you, you idiot. Yeah, well, I just mean plant tube wasn't as big back then. I had to rely on my own intuition, which is why it was such a mess. Anyway, I loved the plant and desperately wanted it to become bushier so I could get more and more of those big, beautiful leaves that we all go crazy for, so it looked like I knew what I was doing. What did I do? I pruned back a couple of the stems. And what happened? Only one stem grew back in their place. How did I take it? Furiously, and I'm not proud of what I said to him at the time, particularly when I realised it really wasn't his fault. We're still taking counselling sessions now, you know. I often think back and wonder just how big my plant would be if I just left it alone. Never mind, no point dwelling on the past, I suppose. And in any case, I got some free extra plants out of it, so all is not lost. So what do you do if you want a super bushy monstera, I hear you wail? Well, my plant friend, the only way to achieve this is to have lots of plants in the pot. More plants equal more stems. Pretty simple, eh? Just have a look at this guy. Looks super bushy, doesn't it? And to the untrained eye, it looks like it's all one big, beautiful plant. On closer inspection, you'll see that there are actually three or four monsteras in the same pot. It's pretty good value, actually. But this isn't something I recommend, mind you. In fact, I'd advise you not to do it. If there's one thing you've probably noticed about your plant, it's that the roots on this bad boy are hella thick. So chuck in three or four monsteras into the same pot, and things will get pretty crowded down there pretty quickly. My big bedroom monstera is actually multiple plants. It looks like one plant from a distance to the untrained eye, but it's not. It's why I've got such a big pot for it. The roots kept getting too crowded, so I kept having to upsize the pot until eventually I said enough is enough and stuck the whole thing in this giant orange one. We'll come back to why this pot isn't such a great idea for him in a jiffy. If you've got a monstera like this then, I'd consider dividing it into individual plants and potting them on, much more likely to thrive. Now, all of this isn't to say you should never behead your monstera. There are times when it might even be the best course of action. If you have one that is getting unruly and not growing how you want, then a chop and reset could be just the ticket 
even if he says he doesn't want it. And I don't mean chop the stem off, chuck it in the bin and wait for new growth on the existing plant. No, I mean taking the chopped off part and starting again with it. And that means rooting it and starting again. But Mr. Sheffield, why on earth would you want to take years of hard work and chuck it all away in the blink of an eye? It just doesn't make sense. First, calm down and second, Check out my monster in my dining room. This is actually a wee cutting from the one in my bedroom and just look how it's growing. It's growing sideways as if it's desperate to escape the pot. Eventually it will leave its enclosure and start crawling along the floor. Not what I want and certainly not what Mrs. Shefford wants, let me tell you. Now, admittedly, this is all my fault. You see, I can admit my mistakes. I've not got him climbing up something and I'll come back to why this is so important in a bit. So unless I want to have my floor taken over by this plant and my eardrums ringing from the missus, I'll probably have to reset it by chopping it off. And the main plant will actually be the piece that I cut off and not the existing plant. And the new leaf should come out fenestrated. This happens with top section cuttings. It doesn't revert to a juvenile state. But don't ask me why. And I'm not going to lob the existing plant in the bin. That will be a waste. Sure, the new stem will probably come out small and boring, but over time, it will grow the way I want, provided I guide it by giving it something to climb up. Right, allow me to give you my hot take. In my humble opinion, it's much better sticking to one plant per pot and putting all your doting energy into that instead of worrying about having multiple stems. It can become a statement piece, particularly if you get it climbing up something, which you most definitely should. Don't provide a Zimmer frame to support him and he'll be spending all his time crawling on the floor, which isn't a clever look. They're climbers in their natural habitat, you see. They grow up along the trunks of nearby trees in order to reach the light at the canopy of the jungle. That's what those weird aerial roots are for, to grip onto the tree and hoist itself up. So try and mimic this in your home. Stick something into the soil and tie the stems to it. Doesn't have to be anything fancy. Lee, a kill this plant, uses bits of tree for his huge monstera and it seems to do a job perfectly. I've just conjured up this weird bamboo trellis system for my fella to grow on and it's doing a job. It's not winning any housekeeping awards of course, but I think it looks fine. The cool thing about it is that the plant will learn there is something there over time and start to grow itself onto it. You can kind of see this happening with the stems of my plant growing closer to the bamboo. Doing all this prevents disasters like stems breaking due to too much weight, but that is an extreme example and unlikely to happen. The main reason for doing this is to make your plant look better. I often do projects like staking my climbing plants up planks of wood on my Patreon page, so check it out if you're interested in a bonus video every week where I do things like this. Plus you get access to our exclusive planty Discord chat. What's not to love? When you've put the hard graft in and tied your monstera onto something to climb up, you just want to leave it there. Choose a spot and leave it alone. Leave it! The perfect spot for this plant, in my opinion, is against the wall facing the light. This way you can leave the plant to grow all its leaves facing in one direction and its ugly backside will be facing the wall and not your living space. This is the cheat code for successful monsteras. To not have the leaves twisting and turning in multiple directions from when you've been rotating them. I said leave it! Look at the surface of the soil of my plant. I mean, what on earth is that? Looks like it's going to metastasize and turn into something and attack me while I sleep. I think this actually appeared when I treated all my plants for fungus gnats by applying wiggly worms to the soil. Beneficial nematodes actually, and I'll leave a link to that video in the corner right now. It's how I finally won the war against those pesky fungus gnats and well worth a watch. But after this one, okay? Now, I don't think they are the nematodes or anything, but it does look to be some sort of mold. And I think it's because it's living in this giant pot without the fable drainage holes. I always recommend drainage holes in my videos, but on this occasion, I didn't take my own advice. I went all rogue one and just plonked it into this. In my defense, I just couldn't find a plastic pot big enough to fit him in. And I thought, no big deal. 
I'd just be careful with the watering. And to be fair, up to this point, it's been working. He's been in there for a few years now and been a happy chappy in that time, but I guess something's going a bit Pete Tong now. And by the way, choosing the right pot for your plant is something I cover in my online houseplant course. Check it out in the description if you want to take your plant game to the next level. Now, I'd quite like to change his nappy, but um, how? Mrs. Sheffield really won't appreciate me making a mess in her bedroom, so I'd need to somehow get it down the stairs and into the garden. Yeah, something for a later date then. The point of this segment is to do as I say and not as I do. Keep your monstera in a pot with drainage holes to avoid things like this happening, as well as other nasties like root rot and a gnat outbreak. I've often called the Monstera adansonii the ugly younger brother to the Monstera deliciosa, and on reflection, this is a tad harsh. Sorry pal, it's not you, it's me. I just didn't understand him, you see, so in defiance, he kept giving me crispy brown leaves and straggly growth to embarrass me in front of all his friends. Sound familiar? Well, I've got you covered with all the tips you need to transform your Adansonia from an ugly duckling into a beautiful swan so that you're not ashamed to show him off to your friends and family. I just wish I knew these tips when I was just starting out with this guy all those many moons ago. I'd have a big beautiful plant on my hands rather than this straggly mess that is trying to come to terms with what I did to him. Oh well, at least his offspring is looking grand. I'll show you how I got this guy to look so handsome compared to his uh, ugly father. Nothing makes an Adansonia look more ugly than brown leaves. I know tons of you struggle with this yourselves. I see it in the comments every day. Well, maybe not every day, but at least every week. Leave it in the comments if this is plaguing yours now. So what's up with all the brown leaves then? Is he just on a mission to send you into despair? Anyway, it's a surprisingly common issue and honestly, there can be a number of reasons why this is happening. Sorry to not lay it all out on a plate for you, but it's true. The reason this was happening to mine, and I would say this is probably the most likely cause, was because I was leaving him to burn in the sun all morning and not topping him up with water when he needed. The poor fella was dying of heat stroke and dehydration all at the same time. They don't seem to like direct sun on the leaves, which is odd considering he's a plant. I thought plants loved the light. The more the merrier, right? Not quite. Tropical plants like our friend Mr. Adansonii tend to hang out under the canopy of the jungle, only getting dappled sunlight in the process. So slap him on a south facing windowsill, if you live in the Northern Hemisphere, of course, and leave him to bake in the sun and have brown scorched leaves in no time. I was young and foolish when I did this, of course, and now I know better. Young and foolish? You've only had the plant three years and you're nearly 40. Well, yes, but a lot can happen in three years. I know better now, and thanks for telling everyone my age. Needless to say, I pulled him back from the window and sat him on my fireplace mantle, which is a much darker spot, and the brown leaves have more or less stopped. But that's not to say everything is rosy though. I mean, look at him, straggly mess, isn't he? The brown leaves went by the wayside and left behind these bare stems. And now he's not growing all that much because he's not in the best light. I just can't win. Let's correct this straggliness now, actually. I've tried tying him onto this trellis, but it's just not working. The stems are just too long and he needs to be restarted. Where's my snippers? What do you think? Looks a bit dramatic, doesn't it? Well, the mantra on this channel is that plants always grow back. They always grow back. As with pretty much any vining plant, Adansonias respond well to having all their limbs cut off. It's like they're born again citizens. All the sins of the past can be forgotten about and replaced with the hope of fresh new vibrant growth. And if the new growth has something to climb up, then even better. To prove this works, check out the Adansonia in my bedroom. He's loving life, just look at him. The gaps between the nodes on the stems are nice and short and the leaves are getting nice and big at top. All signs of a happy plant that is getting the right light and love from me. This is actually a cutting I took from the other plant. They look completely different, don't they? Well, it too was starting to get a bit straggly, so I cut it right back, stuck this trellis, trellis behind it as a support, and it's never looked back. These plants love climbing up something, but the best tip I can give you is to start this when it's a baby. This way it knows there's something to climb up and starts to use its aerial roots to cling on. Look, it's clung its aerial roots into the wood and I no longer have to tie it on with string. Pretty neat, eh? This is exactly what I want my other one to do now that I've cut it right back. You just don't need fancy moss bowls for your climbing plants, you see. 
anything straight and tall will do the job. You'll also notice that the leaves at the bottom are smaller than the ones at the top. This happens with climbing plants. They get more and more proud the higher they climb and like to flex to show off. Dar things. Back to the brown leaves, what else can be causing it? Overwatering would be a good shout. Yes, I know you've heard it too many times before, don't overwater your plants. But what does this actually mean? Surely they get plenty of rain in the jungle and they seem to love life there, right? Yes, this is true, but they're also not confined to a small plastic pot that doesn't allow for good evaporation. Water can drain freely in a jungle setting and the roots won't be sat in waterlogged soil for long. This can easily happen in a pot if you're watering your plant every weekend without checking the soil first. This is another mantra of the channel. Always check the soil before watering. Turns out there's a few mantras I should make t-shirts. Anyway, it's not really the water that is the killer here. Your Adansonia will happily live in just water after all. Nope. It's the lack of oxygen. Just like you and me, our plants need oxygen to breathe. I know, right? As if they're not needy enough. Without oxygen, these roots will just turn to rot and die. So how can you tell when your plant needs a drink? You get Mr. Sheffield's favorite affiliate link, the moisture meter, probe that sucker and water when it reads dry. Trust me, it's the best way, no more guessing. You can do it the old school way with your finger or even a used chopstick, of course, but I find both of those things to be fairly unreliable. So you're probably now wondering why overwatering causes brown leaves. Well, I don't want to get too technical, but essentially the plant is taking up too much water through the roots until the leaf cells can't take anymore and they burst, leaving behind this brown scarring. This is the same with underwatering too. Too little water and the cells become dehydrated until they burst. So water when the soil is dry, but don't leave it too long. And don't stress about watering a bit too early. To properly overwater your Adansonii, you need to keep it in wet soil for a long time. Weeks, if not months. Long enough for the roots to rot. So the odd watering too early here or there won't do too much damage. Famous last words. Watering is the lifeblood of plants, of course, which is why I dedicated a whole lesson to it in my online houseplant course that is linked in the description. It's got all the tips and tricks you need in one place to keep thriving plants in the home. Go check it out. So matey, you've just cut off all those stems. What are you gonna do with them? Not chuck them in the bin, I hope. That would be a waste of epic proportions. Turn them into lots more plants that you then have no idea what to do with in your home. Or you can at least give them away as cheap Christmas presents. Propagation is dead simple, I promise. You need three things. The plant, a glass and some water. Okay, let me hold your hand. Start from the bottom and locate the last leaf node. You know, the bumpy bit where the leaf comes from. Cut just underneath to tidy it up. Go up to the next node and cut just above. Not below, above, this is key. You should have a cutting with a leaf at the bottom and the top. Remove the bottom leaf. And that's it. Pop it into a glass of water wait a few weeks for roots to appear. Do this all along the stem until you reach the top. Once you've got roots, pop them into some soil and new shoots will appear in no time. When it comes to potting up cuttings, there is one thing I used to do that I don't do anymore and it's making all the difference. Before, I would take a bunch of my rooted cuttings and add them all to the same pot to create a nice bushy specimen. This is fine and dandy if you're happy to have a trailing type of planter, but if you want a climber, then stick to one cutting per pot. This is exactly what I've done to my bedroom Adansonia, and he's very handsome if I do say so myself. Having multiple cuttings trying to fight for space on this trellis just wouldn't work. It's much better having just one centerpiece taking all the glory. Don't get me wrong, four pots of plants can look absolutely stunning, but with climbers, it's much better to have one statement plant per pot. In all of my three years of caring for this plant, I've noticed that it don't do well in heavy soil. I've got the inquisitive eye of Columbo, you see. This plant that I keep referring to in my bedroom hasn't been without its problems. Nope, it's not all plain sailing in this house. A few months ago, I asked Mrs. Sheffield to buy me some compost on her travels so I could repot him, but she brought me topsoil instead. Never mind, I said. I'll try topsoil and add tons more perlite to make it more palatable for him. Needless to say, not a smart move. Topsoil is never good for houseplants. It's just far too heavy and only suitable for the lawn or borders in the garden. Needless to say, it's suffered. 
Some of the leaves at the bottom turn yellow, a telltale sign that the soil is preventing the plant drawing up the nutrients it needs because it's too dense. I didn't cry about it. I cut the yellow leaves off to keep up the illusion I'm a responsible plant dad and then set about repotting him into a decent mix. And the yellowing stopped, thankfully. And if you're on the lookout for a decent mix, then check out my link to Cybersoil in the description for a 10% discount of all their products. Humidity for this plant is pretty simple, like it is for most plants. They're pretty resilient and will adapt to your surroundings so long as you keep them in a consistent environment. This just means not sticking them in front of an air conditioning unit or above a radiator, not a recipe for success. Folks see problems with their plant and tend to assume it's a humidity problem, when in fact, it's more likely to be a watering or light problem. You can try adding a humidifier to the mix if you live in the desert, but I've never been a fan of them. They create too many other problems in the house. My pride and joy, you know, the one in the bedroom, is settled in its spot away from radiators and windows it's pretty happy. That one bit of browning on that leaf is a bit of a concern, but it seems to have stopped spreading now at least. I must admit that this plant was close to ending up on my list of 12 easy care plants that are actually a nightmare video, but really once you understand what it wants, it's not too bad. Well, ladies and gentlemen, I have a monstera with a couple of yellowing leaves. There's no time to panic because this issue can be easily diagnosed and corrected. So let's go through the steps I take to diagnosing why this plant is turning yellow and determine what we need to do about it. Whenever I spot a yellowing problem on any of my plants, the first thing I want to rule out immediately is pests. And if you have a similar issue, I highly recommend this as a first step. If your plant is turning yellow because it's infested with pests, and you've got a real problem on your hands, especially because the problem can easily spread to your other house plants. So if I suspect that there's pests on this plant, then the first thing I'm gonna do is gonna grab the plant and take it away from all of these other plants so that the problem doesn't spread. So you don't need to worry about fungus gnats because they won't cause yellowing on the leaves of a house plant, but you do want to check for things like webbing and white spots. Webbing on the leaves is an indication of spider mites. So you want to grab a phone or a torch or a light and just shine it on the underside of the leaves. See if you can see any fine webbing where the petiole meet the leaves. That tends to be where spider mites hang out. And this is the damaged leaf, all yellow. I can't see any webbing. Let's look a little bit further down. Can't see any on the stems. It's a good idea to get the light behind the plant as well, so any webbing shows up. No webbing whatsoever. The next thing we want to look for is if there's any white blobs that we can see on any of the stems. Doesn't look like there are. White blobs on stems would be mealybugs. But this plant looks quite clear. And the next thing you want to do is just kind of inspect the leaf, the suspect leaf, and see if there's any spotting. Spotting would indicate that a little pest, such as a spider mite or a frip, is munching away at the sap of the leaf. Maybe a little bit there, but it doesn't seem like it's see-through. So I don't see much, if any, damage from critters sucking away at the sap. Another good check is to get yourself a piece of paper, something white, cardboard or whatever, just lay it on the floor or on a table, grab your plant and just shake the foliage over it quite vigorously like that. And then any frips or any spider mites that are on the plant will fall off onto the white sheet of paper and you'll be able to see it. So I've just got this white counter in my kitchen. So there's things moving around and you've got bugs basically. And there is a little black spot there that I've noticed that was suspect, but it's not moving around, so it's just a bit of dirt probably. I don't appear to have a pest problem, but if you do, you'd need to treat your plant properly and then isolate the plant for a few weeks to make sure you've got rid of the problem. Check out my plant pest video for more details on all the common house plant pests and what to do about them. You also want to rule out any disease issues on the plant. You're looking for things like mold, powdery mildew, or leaf spot. These diseases are fairly easy to spot. For mold and powdery mildew, you're looking for a white powdery coating on the leaves. And for leaf spot, you're looking for pronounced brown or black spots on the leaves with a general yellowing on the plant. So I'm definitely not seeing any mold or powdery mildew on these leaves or stems. All looks quite clear on that front. Nothing white, nothing powdery. I am wondering whether that's a bit of leaf spot maybe. That browning around the edge there is a little bit suspect. So there's a possibility that this has a bit of a disease. 
So all will be revealed when we have a look at the roots. Probably the most common issue that results in a yellowing monstera is the plant being root bound. Now monsteras do like to have quite a compact pot, but they do get to a point where they are too root bound. Compacted roots mean that the plant is unable to draw up sufficient nutrients to the foliage, which results in yellow leaves. Plants need nitrogen to feed growth and keep the leaves green and healthy, and a root bound plant will have difficulty accessing enough nitrogen. If your plant is severely root bound, then the first thing you'll notice is that it's much thirstier than normal. Okay, so the moment of truth, is this plant root bound? I think it obviously is because of all these area roots that are growing into the soil of this plant. I've not potted it up for quite a long time, so let's just have a look inside. So this is the outer part. I can't even get the inner part out. There we go. There's a massive bulge there. I don't know if you can see it on the camera. So there's loads of roots in here bulging out. So it's clearly root bound. It's got roots coming out of the bottom, which is never a great thing. Look at that root snake snaking all the way around. So I'm gonna trim these roots back. You can do that to plants. They don't mind having a bit of a root pruning. Got a video on the channel all about that. Also, I'm going to cut that area root off to make my life a little bit easier. If you're struggling to get a plant out of its pot, then just give it a light press around the edge to loosen it up. And if you're really, really struggling, then you can always cut the pot out from the plant. Do that as a last resort, because I want to keep the pot, really. There we go. Look at that. That's a lot of roots in there. So this plant has been struggling because there was just far too many roots in the pot. Tend to end up with yellowing leaves because there's not enough nutrients, not enough nitrogen going up into the leaves. Yellow leaves can also indicate that you're giving the plant too much water and the roots are rotting. Rotting roots become ineffective at drawing up nutrients to the foliage and the leaves will start to turn yellow. The best way to check if you're giving your plant too much water is to first probe the soil with a moisture meter if you have one and then take the plant out of its pot and inspect the roots. A regular lack of water can also cause yellowing problems for your monstera, especially if you're neglecting your plant for weeks at a time. These periods of drought will damage the roots in much the same way overwatering will and affects the ability of the plant to draw up nutrients. So I go around my plants every weekend and probe them to check if they need water. So I'm pretty good at spotting when they need water, but my plant is root bound, so it's probably not getting enough for the amount of roots that are in the pot. Another common cause of yellowing leaves is too much sun. Most houseplants don't like direct sun on the leaves. They tend to scorch, but in my experience, monsteras can handle some direct sunlight. This will depend on where you live and how strong the sun is though. Don't take your monstera from a dark position in your home to an intense south facing position with lots of direct light and not expect some fading on the leaves. It would need to be a much more gradual process. The thing to look out for is a general fading on all the leaves as well as some yellowing and browning around the edges. So my monstera sits on this shelving unit on my windowsill on my west facing living room. So it gets about four, five, six hours of direct sun every day. So we can turn it around and have a look at the leaves in its position. And as you can see, not all of the leaves are fading, if any at all. It just seems to be these two leaves that it's affecting. The one at the back, that's the severely yellow one. A little bit of browning on the edge in there. Doesn't look particularly faded, I don't think. Just looks like it's yellowing. And that one, a little bit of fading around the edges, but there's more the yellow spotting in the middle. That's the problem. Looking at all the other leaves, like that one, for example, looks quite healthy, quite dark, lots of fenestration. This one's got some perforations in the middle, but there's no fading on these three leaves. If this plant was getting too much sun, then all of the leaves would be faded. I'm not really seeing that on this plant, so I don't think it's too much sun. The lack of nutrients will be a problem for your monstera if you completely neglect to give it any fertilizer during the growing season, and if your plant is root bound like mine is. You're looking for a general yellowing and fading of the leaves as the plant struggles to keep pigment in the leaves because it can't access enough nitrogen. And fertilizer root burn can cause yellowing leaves and normally happens if you give your plant too strong a dose or fertilize too often. Unfortunately, there's no easy way to identify if the plant is suffering from fertilizer root burn apart from knowing how often 
often you've been applying fertilizer and ruling out all the other causes that I've explained in this video. If you do suspect that this is the cause, then you need to change the soil, give the roots a rinse in the process and not fertilize again for at least a couple of months. I often forget to fertilize my plants. So I would say my Monstera is suffering from a lack of nutrients and is also caused by it being root bound. 